What's up YouTube? Today we are looking at foundations specifically in context with the uh, iStruct E exam and I'm going to be running through six things in terms of what you should be thinking about when you're designing foundations in the exam and I've got some step-by-step -step processes here to, to, to get you ready. Now just before we get started if you've got any questions leave them in the comments. Uh, so first up, when pretty much all of the, the questions you get given, you'll be told the ground conditions. So I would recommend your first step is to sketch out those ground conditions. Um, it shows your understanding and it'll also start preparing you to think about um, how you're going to approach your foundation design. So that is step one. Secondly, um, come prepared and start learning these sort of rules of thumb because that's going to lead to the next step in terms of actually choosing a suitable foundation. Um, at a super high level, there's really sort of two things that affect what foundation you're looking at. Um, firstly, that's the quality of the ground. And secondly, it's the magnitude of the loads. So it's sort of a, a balance between those two, which will sort of um, guide you to a suitable foundation. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. Next, I just want to highlight there a few watch it's, um, things to the sort of red flags and you're definitely, we need to show that we appreciate that they exist and uh, handle them sort of adequately and appreciate them in our design. So I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Then, so I'm just sort of focusing on the, the section one where you're just scheming it, not the actual sort of detailed design in section two. So I'll talk about how we sort of scheme them. And then I've got a recommendation for some further reading later on if you really want to sort of like get um, your hands dirty in foundation design and finesse your skills. So I've scrolled down a bit far here. Give me two seconds. Uh, so here's a, I've just picked a random example, September 22 exam. Uh, I'm not going to go too detailed in the client requirements, etc., because I just want to sort of focus on, you know, um, looking at the ground specifically. Um, obviously the two go hand in hand, but anyway, so site conditions, let's have a look here. And pretty much all the questions tell you what's going on in the ground. Uh, so the ground conditions vary linearly from west to east across the site. So on the west and the east, um, we've got some made ground from half a metre to one and a half metres and they don't really give you any sort of engineering properties there. So that to me sort of implies that we're not really supposed to use this as a, as a bearing material. And then from about what half a meter to three meters across the site, we've got some silty sand and an N value of 25. I'll talk about a little bit later what that actually means and how to use it. And then below two meters to three meters on the east, we've got some very dense sand and gravel with an N value of 45. And we've been told here that no groundwater was encountered. So if we go back to what I just mentioned earlier, the first step is to sketch the ground conditions. So here, um, yeah, is exactly that. I've got the ground level and we've got that sort of um, varying ground profile. We've got the made ground at the top where we haven't been given any engineering properties. We've got the silty sand um, on top of very dense sand and gravel sand. So these values in the scheme of things, it shows that you've got some high quality uh, subsurface materials and it's they're located not too deep, like three meters in the, th in the scheme of things <clears throat> isn't a very uh, deep uh, layer to get to. So some rules of thumbs, and these are really handy to, to, to memorize and have up your sleeve. These are some empirical formulas and they're obviously not suitable in detailed design, but for a scheme design, um, and what we're sort of looking at at the iShark D exam, they're, um, they're really useful and applicable. So these are pretty much how you use those engineering values that you get given in the question to um, get to some allowable bearing capacities. And that's how we end up sort of scheming up some suitable foundations and some appropriate sizes. So if we're given a clay, um, and a C value of the unjoined shear strength, you would times it by two and a half to get the allowable bearing capacity. 
in an unsaturated soil, i.e. not within the groundwater table. If it was within the groundwater table, you simply halve it and that is your bearing capacity. For this particular question, we haven't been given any cohesive soils. We've been given granular soils. So we've just got the silty sand here and <clears throat> the very dense sand. And they just give us the end values of the SBT test. So what we do there, um, pretty quick and dirty, but it works, is you times it by 10. Um, and that gives you the allowable bearing capacity. Again, if it's dry, if it's wet, uh, divide that by two, and that's what you can use as your allowable bearing capacity. So uh, we've essentially got here uh, 250 kPa allowable bearing capacity within this silty sand, and then 450 kPa, which is a pretty high bearing capacity in this very dense sand and gravel sand. So that sort of will lead us into um, thinking about, okay, what are some uh, appropriate foundation systems? And I've scrolled a bit too far again. So next, I just want to talk about um, some watch it. So uh, we just spoke a little bit about um, the groundwater table. So when they talk about, okay, you know, if the groundwater table was within our um, ground profile, a few things that you would be thinking and considering is uh, buoyancy. So that's the uplift resistance on the foundation um, and the constructability of it too. Like, do we require any dewatering locally at the site? And its influence on bearing capacity, just what I mentioned there. If your bearing, if your groundwater table's within your soil profile, that will sort of uh, reduce the uh, the bearing capacities. So it's important that we acknowledge that, appreciate that, and demonstrate that in our um, solutions. Um, yeah, because your examiner will be looking for that. Uh, because they don't really, they don't tell you this stuff for no reason. You, we really have to show that we, um, you know, understand it's there and deal with it appropriately. So another one is um, sloping sites. That's if your ground profile is sort of varying, um, not not varying like in this case here. Uh, it's if the ground level itself was sort of like picking up. Um, and yeah, what that really leads to is, you know. Um, you probably would need to introduce some form of retaining wall to because uh, your base level or your ground slabs typically flat. Um, so it's just yeah something to think about. Uh, another one, if you've been told you got reactive clays, that means the uh, the soil shrinks and swell. Um, we need to accommodate that within our design. If there's an adjacent building. Uh, Keep in mind that sort of 45 degree angle of influence that um, the load spreads underneath a footing. And if you're disturbing that, you're going to, yeah, have to address that. Um, that could be done with like a sheet pile wall. But essentially, yeah, if you're um, excavating right next to an existing building with existing foundations, that's something to um, address. Uh, and finally, I've just got here contaminated lands. So if they tell you there's contaminated land, make sure that you, you acknowledge it and you dress it appropriately in your construction sequences and uh, foundation designs. Um, moving on, so we've, uh, in section one, we're gonna have to do some scheme designs. So it's not the, like the detailed design, but it is an appreciation, okay. Um, if we're using pads, if we're using piles, what sizes are we talking about? So we just came up with some rough um, approximate bearing capacities. So essentially for pad designs, we would size our pad where we'd work out the axial load on from the columns that go bearing into our uh, pad footings and create an area of pad of the pad, which was um, when you do force, which I've got N here, divided by A, which is the width times the breadth of your pad footing, make sure it's less than that <clears throat> allowable bearing capacity that we worked out from our rule of thumbs earlier. Um, and then the depth of a pad, you would pretty much determine, um, you might do a back of the envelope calc to make sure that you don't need any, say, shear reinforcement to make it deep enough that the, the concrete um, can resist that shear force by itself. Uh, that would be suitable for um, just a, a quick scheme. And then later in the detailed design, you'd get um, 
a more exact solution in section two. Um, ground bearing slabs. Uh, so it's literally if it was just bearing on the ground directly and didn't have any other, um, you know, edge thickenings, etc. 200 is sort of a pretty typical number to run with, and you could go shallower if you did have, say, a raft with um, edge beams and internal beams that it was spanning between. And then piles, a similar approach. You would just make sure that your allowable bearing pressures were less than the allowable bearing capacities based off those rule of thumbs that we shared earlier. And then some pretty typical diameters would be 600 to 1200. And you can grab your hand on some, some size guides in terms of you know what diameter you want for a particular depth. But there's just some standard ones there that, you know, We'll keep you in the ballpark. Uh, so for that example, I've pulled up sort of like two um, two solutions that I would put together for the previous ISHAC-D exam. Um, so we've really got like sort of like two different foundation systems possible. People talk about shallow foundations or uh, deep foundations. And I'm sure if you're watching this video, you're pretty across... Um, those two foundation systems and what um, you want to keep in mind is you pretty much the, the shallow foundation is uh, like more cheaper economical solution so we pretty much always try to go for that if the uh, if the situation permits so that means if the loads aren't huge onto the foundations and if the ground conditions are, are suitable now this was a hotel development that was only four stories high so that means the the loads aren't going to be um, you know it's not like a, a 30 story tower so the loads probably aren't going to be super large and we've got some pretty you know 250 kPa and this is a typo, 450 kPa uh, within the first sort of five meters. So they're pretty good ground conditions. So the fact that we've got um, not super high loads and we've got a good quality ground material, that leads us to um, shallow foundations because they're more economical. So here what I've done is I've got rid of that sort of that top fill and replaced it with engineered fill. And then I've placed some some pad footings at roughly half a meter deep with a pedestal to, to link up my columns. And again, I haven't looked at what the actual geometry of the building is in detail, which you would obviously need to. This is just an opportunity to look at exactly what's happening in the ground. And then I've got my ground bearing slab sort of isolated from my vertical elements being the columns and pad footings and that just bears directly on this engineered fill. Uh, so that would be one uh, potential solution. The downside of this is that you sort of had to excavate the that, that top layer of fill. So another um, suitable solution would be the uh, like a raft foundation where you've got sort of a uh, a slab tied into some edge beams and internal beams. I've got my edge beams down about half a meter, so they're actually bearing onto that um, silty sand, which has got about 250 kPa. And then that made ground here, I wouldn't rely my slab to be bearing. It would be spanning between these internal beams and edge beams. And I'm just showing here that your um, the depth of these... Um, beams can be a sort of like consistent depth. We don't actually have to excavate all the way down to wherever that silty sand is. Instead, we can, um, oh, sorry, the, the edge beam doesn't have to go down there. We can um, replace it with some engineered fill, which is what I'm showing in this red hatch here. So yeah, they're two suitable foundation systems, both of them shallow that I would propose for this particular building in this particular ground. Uh, if you um, yeah, have any questions or disagree with something, put it in the put it in the comments. Thanks guys.